Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Fred Muratori. I'm the selector for English language literatures, theater and film at the Cornell University Library. Uh, as some of you know, Cornell is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayu Gayukono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayukono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayukono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this Chats in the Stacks book talk. Our Chats in the Stacks book talk series is dedicated to providing Cornell faculty authors an opportunity to share their recently published books with a cross-disciplinary audience. And we're happy to say that audience is growing all the time. While the ongoing pandemic has forced our transition to a virtual format, we look forward to a time in which we can again safely welcome in-person audiences for events like this. And we're cheered to see that so many are joining us from all over the world uh, this afternoon. Before I introduce today's speaker, I should mention that a question and answer session will follow the presentation. So please feel free to type your questions into the Zoom chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Dr. Karen Jaime is Assistant Professor of Performing and Media Arts and Latina Latino Latinx Studies. She earned a doctorate in performance studies at NYU. And we're very proud to say her BA right here at Cornell. And she even worked in the libraries, which makes us extra proud of being able to, to, to feature her today. A past visiting fellow at the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics at NYU and Woodrow Wilson Career Enhancement Junior Faculty Fellow Karen is also a former Rockefeller Foundation Research Fellow and a Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Associate at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her critical writing has appeared in Women in Performance, a Journal of Feminist Theory, E. Misferica, Small Acts, a Caribbean Journal of Criticism, and TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. In addition to Karen's critical writing and research, she is an accomplished spoken word performance artist. She served as the host and curator for the Friday Night Poetry Slam at the world-renowned New York and Poets Cafe, participated in the spoken word documentary Split, and was featured in the Emmy Award-winning CUNY TV program Nueva York, a show focusing on the different aspects of Latinx culture in New York City. As a published poet, Karen's work is included in The Best of Panic, En Vivo from the East Village, Flicker and Spark, a queer anthology of spoken word and poetry, Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural lesbian literary and art journal, and in the anthology Latinas, Struggles and Protest in 21st Century USA. Karen's new book, The Queer New Yorican, Racialized Sexualities and Aesthetics in Loisida, which was published by, it's hot off the press, just published by NYU Press, uses hip hop studies alongside critical race, queer, literary, and performance theories in order to demonstrate the ways in which historically pejorative identity markers are recuperated and recodified as useful tools in the development of contemporary aesthetic practices. In the words of Ramon H. Rivera Severa, sorry, Severa, Dean of the College of Fine Arts at the University of Texas at Austin, quote, Karen Jaime's assessment of the aesthetics cultivated and mobilized at the New Yorican Poets Cafe takes a groundbreaking turn to render queer contributions as central to the artistic, cultural, and political legacy and future of this beloved institution. Bringing to light previously unexamined archival materials and offering a proximity of analysis only possible from the vantage point of a creative participant in the scene, Karen Jaime allows us to discover the New Yorican anew. This intimate and rigorous volume will shape all future scholarship on the cafe and the New Yorican aesthetic. So all of you, please welcome Karen Jaime. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction, Fred. I'd also like to thank Peggy Tully, Suzette Newberry, and Sean Taylor for helping to make this event happen. 
For purposes of our conversation here today, I'll begin by discussing how I came to this project and then sort of move towards providing an overview by reading some excerpts from the book itself and conclude by sharing where I envision this research going from here. In many ways, this book began with a class I took as an undergrad here at Cornell in 1993, sitting in one of the classrooms on the first floor of Goldwyn Smith Hall. It was in that class where I first read about the New Yorican Poets Cafe, a space also referred to as the New Yorican, the Cafe, and the Nuyo, and how it began in 1973 with informal gatherings in poet writer Miguel Algarín's living room on East 6th Street before moving to its current location at 236 East 3rd Street between avenues B and C. Algarín, a former professor of Shakespeare at Rutgers University, brings together people as diverse as New Yorican poetry icon Pedro Pietri, well known for his performance of Puerto Rican obituary, Miguel Mikey Piñero, a poet, playwright, and actor, and visual artist, poet, and writer, Lois Elaine Griffith. In this class, I also learned about the ethnic marker New York Rican, its reclamation as New Yorican, and the difference between the Lower East Side East Village and the ethnic enclave of Loisaida. Looking back, it was the politics inherent in the founding and naming of the small performance space in downtown New York City in the early 1970s, where people of color and other counterculture artists came together to write and perform within a class-based and ethically marked neighborhood that first appealed to me as a young college student coming to more critically understand her race, gender, class, and sexuality. The conversations initiated by these early poets and performers at the cafe modeled for me the type of artist activism that I hope to undertake. And I made it my mission to visit and hopefully perform there someday. So I begin the book by describing how ecstatic I was on that Friday night in 1997, when a group of friends and I decide to go to the cafe after having dinner in the West Village. I can still remember the anticipation of waiting on that line to go in, the butterflies in my stomach. Yet in first visiting the space, I was taken aback by the size of the space. This is the size of the bar, how small it was, um, the type of work that I saw performed and how the poetry lacked the politics that I was hoping for. Perhaps it was the competition inherent in the Poetry Slam that evening. For those of you that are unfamiliar, a Poetry Slam is a three round poetry competition consisting of five poets. Poets are judged by five sets of randomly selected groups of judges on a scale of one to 10, including decimal points. One is the lowest, 10 is the highest, and the highest and lowest scores are dropped with 10 being the highest possible score a poet is able to receive per round. Maybe it was the changing neighborhood surrounding the cafe. Maybe it was a combination of both resulting in an increasing quote unquote forgetfulness or ignorance regarding the history of the space. I wasn't entirely sure why some younger poets understood the history and created work that reflected the initial politics of the space, although they were not necessarily ethnically New Yorican, while others demonstrated an investment in creating work that was about form rather than content, about getting tens during the poetry slam and performing a version of consciousness that was recognizable to mainstream audiences while their writing and performance didn't really do anything but reify stereotypes rather than challenge them. As a queer feminist, I was troubled by the emphasis and focus on the cis male founders and performers and their framing as heterosexual. Cis women were rarely mentioned, although we can thank Patricia Herrera's book, New Yorican Feminist Performance, for really, um, for that incredible intervention. Um, and queer poets were often discussed as the exceptions. Although I was to later learn through my involvement in the New Yorican community as the host of the Friday Night Poetry Slam, that a number of the foundational poets and performers, including Miguel Algarín and Miguel Piñero were queer, although they used terms such as quote unquote fluid. This search for queerness at the cafe and for my doctoral research at NYU, as it became increasingly evident that there was a connection between queerness and the performances happening in the space since its founding, and that the cafe's history was queer, not just in terms of sexualities, but also in terms of how performance practices emerged there that challenged notions of low versus high art, rejected constructions of what constituted quote unquote proper writing, and that the performances happening inside the cafe were informed and affected by the socio-political and economic changes occurring outside of the space 
specifically in terms of gentrification. For example, this is an early image of, this is an initial image of the cafe in the 1980s. You can see sort of how that reflects what the Lower East Side was like during that time. Um, this is a later image before the installation of the wind guards, um, actually a little before 1997. And this is a current image of the cafe after 2005. So we can, we can see the neighborhood changes reflected in the facade of the space. The changes outside of the cafe due to gentrification and a renewed economic investment in the neighborhood, alongside the popularity of poetry slam as a performance genre, led to a change in the people both attending and performing in the space. The cafe was no longer a primarily local community space. This move away from the local also impacted the term New Yorican uppercase N, how it was used, and more importantly, who it referred to. So while New Yorican uppercase N was an ethnic marker initially used to refer to people born and or raised in New York City of Puerto Rican descent, it started being used to refer to poets and performers affiliated with the cafe. It became both an ethnic marker and arguably a brand, which for me wasn't unproblematic. Was there a way to recognize poets and performers who aligned themselves with the original mission and politics of the cafe who weren't necessarily Puerto Rican? What about queerness? How did it impact the type of work produced? These questions ultimately led to my research and to the completion of this book where I analyzed the historical, political, and cultural conditions under which the term New Yorican shifted from a race ethnic identity marker to lowercase n New Yorican, an aesthetic practice and political poetical alliance. Without realizing it, I was wading into a debate that began in 1997 between Bob Holman and Pedro Pietri. 1997, in the New York Times, Bob Holman says, we are all New Yorican. Pedro Pietri responds, this is something that belongs to us. We'll share it, but there are limits. Bob stated in the New York Times, anybody can be a New Yorican. That's bullshit. The debate between Pietri, a foundational figure of the New Yorican movement and the cafe and Bob Holman, a white performer, poetry activist and former director of the poetry program at the cafe underscores the theorizations, the poetic formulations, the call and response interactions and the histories and argumentation encoded in New Yorican ethnic marker and New Yorican aesthetics. The Spanglish term New Yorican initially a pejorative is reappropriated by Algarín and Piñero for their cafe. Algarín and Piñero recodify New Yorican as an ethnic and political marker for artists of Puerto Rican descent. In turn, I use New Yorican with a lowercase n to refer to an aesthetic practice rooted in broadening the specific ethnic marker New Yorican to include queer, trans, and diasporic performance modalities. So we can see here the difference. Similar to a critical engagement with blackness as diasporic, the New Yorican aesthetic queers fixed definition of New Yorican identity by recognizing and including queer poets and performers of color whose writing and performance build upon the politics inherent in the cafe's founding, extending them within Loisaida's changing demographics. Subsequently, the neighborhood shift from a predominantly immigrant racial minoritarian working class space to a gentrified white middle-class neighborhood results in a querying of the term New Yorican. This shift is made evident through the resultant aesthetic practices that emerge and flourish at the cafe. And it is this querying of New Yorican that undergirds the New Yorican aesthetic. Because of its international reach, I envision this New Yorican aesthetic as local, circulating beyond its initial formation at the cafe in Loisaida in New York City, and traveling with these writer performers to critique and imagine new political and literary land slash soundscapes across the US and Europe. Throughout the book, my critical engagement is specifically with queerness as emblematized by the queer performers whose work I analyze, the cafe and aesthetics and racialized sexualities as they are initially enacted on that stage in Loisaida. My focus is on a specific location and the interplay between a locally rooted community and an aesthetics of poetics and performance highlighted by spoken word that became international. Just as there is a distinction between the Lower East Side and Loisaida, there's a difference between identifying someone as New Yorican, someone of any ethnicity affiliated with the cafe and calling them a New Yorican, signaling an emerging global artistic aesthetic and politic. So what do I do with this, right? So these are the artists that I write about. In chapter one, 
I juxtapose the relationship between Miguel Pinero's writing, performance, and sexuality with the contemporary changes to Loisaida's demography and culture. I trace the ways that Pinero's streetwise and urban ryth rhythmic poetries function as queer critical tools challenging the heterosexist fixity of ethnic, racial, and sexual identities. Um, specifically, I investigate how Pinero's queer free swagger functions as a performance that marks and claims racial sexual space as he takes ownership of his geographic surroundings through thinking, naming, and calling out as he walks. This chapter historically situates the cafe and the queer art making and sex practices that have existed there since its founding. As evidenced in the clip I will share with you, Pinero employs a distinct methodology and performance approach that continues to leave its imprint and fuel contemporary poets and performers at the cafe. He died yesterday, he's dying today, he'll be dead tomorrow, dying, dead, seeking a cause, seeking he calls, and the cause was in front of him. And the cause was in his skin, and the cause was in his speech, and his cause was in his blood, but he died seeking the cause, seeking a cause. He died deaf, dumb, and blind. He died, 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 and he never found his cause, you see, because he never knew that he was the cause. Good night, my love, well, it's time to go. So Pinero really sets the, the tone and the tenor for some of the aesthetics that we see deployed by contemporary poets in poetry slams, not just in terms of content, but in terms of performance modality. In chapter two, uh, this is the remix, Reggie Cabico's Filipino Shuffle. I focus on poet, performer, and cultural activist Reggie Cabico's queer Filipino reimagining of the miniseries, The Thornbirds, and of the films Hollywood Shuffle and Monsters Ball. I explore how he utilizes humor in the form of parody and camp, alongside the hip hop practices of sampling and remixing to articulate a New York aesthetic. This excerpt from a TED talk delivered by Cabico is from one of his initial, um, will we'll show one of his initial and most well-recognized poems, check one. The government asks me to check one if I want money. I say, how could you ask me to be one race? I stand proudly before you, a fierce Filipino, who knows how to belt hard gospel songs played to African drums at a Catholic mass and loving the music to suffering beats and lashes from men's eyes on the capital streets. Southeast DC with its sleepy crime, my mother nursed patients from seven to nine. Chapter three tends across the board, the glam slam at the New Rican Poets Cafe, focuses on the verbal and oral articulations of the participants in the Glam Slam at the cafe from 1998 to 2008. As a definitively queer happening, this event brought together the competitive spoken word and slam poetry and ball culture communities, resulting in a new framework for the proclamation of queer poetics. During the Glam Slam and similar to the competitive balls of New York's Black and Caribeño queer, drag and trans communities documented most famously in Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning, poets walked the runway and instead of voguing against one another, performed poetry in categories including best love poem and fire engine red and best wig a poem among others. In bringing together these two communities, competitors queered the New Yorican in terms of the proclaimed sexualities of the performers and audiences, as well as the types of performances that occurred at the cafe. So I'll show two clips here. One is of uh, the mother of the house of Xavier reading the rules, and we can really see this queer intervention at the cafe. I am feeling shady, honey. Shady boy, heterosexual, shady, snotty, snobby, uh, not correct, ill mannered. <laughs> Arrogant, obnoxious, lack of decorum. Work the fucking vocabulary, bitch. Always give it to my child, Robert and Xavier. He always gives me the proper white words to say. <laughs> Whitney is the famous one. Whatever. 
And then this moment of queer joy. Th this event was particularly compelling for me, not just because it brought together um, poetry slam communities and drag ball communities, but the ways in which queer joy in this instant really challenged the precarity of queer of color lives. <laughs> And in chapter four, Black Crackers Chasing Rainbows, Hip Hop Minstrelsy, Queer Futurity and Trans Multiplicity, I focus on the work of Ellison Glenn, a contemporary transgender spoken word performance artist and musician. Through his performance persona, Black Cracker, Glenn appropriates a historically pejorative term and recodifies it, ultimately forging a critique of the current political, social, and economic conditions of African Americans in the US through both poetry and music. And this is from his, um, from his work as Black Cracker. I entitled the conclusion The Open Room because that is the name of an evolving event, which originally served as the open mic at the cafe but which now denotes the gatherings that bring the festivities of the Friday Night Poetry Slam to a close. Unlike the Poetry Slam competition held earlier in the evening, the open room provides a space for the sharing of work. There are no scores, just applause if the small audience that stays behind at the end of a long Friday night deems the poet worthy. People who feel too nervous, scared, or apprehensive about slamming tend to workshop their writing during the open room. This event connects the organic poetic gatherings of the 1970s with a contemporary audience. For example, Algarin describes the open room as, quote, the basis for the open, generous, embracing attitude that is in fact the aesthetic of the cafe and its continuity through all the years is our root. I am reminded of a conversation I had with Algarin in December 2018 while visiting him in a, in a nursing home wherein he told me, yeah, the aesthetic, so I think we got to plan a new book, a new anthology with a new aesthetic, not the old one. Already we did theater. There's a book on theater. We did The Primary New Yorican. There's a book, 1975, on theater and poetry. We wrote the essays and covered the book. Lois wrote the essay for the action book. We got the original basis. You guys can stand on that. Those voices from the New Yorican and the aesthetic of the voice that comes up there. What does it mean? And you can write it. This moment with Algarin brings me back to when I first stepped onto the stage at the New Regan Poets Cafe during the open room in 97. The open room generally starts between 12.45 and 1 a.m. after a majority of the crowd has left, um, serving as the non-competitive conclusion for the evening's earlier poetry slam. The open room also operates as the beginning for many poets, myself included. That evening, after I walked the brief distance from the front row to the stage, Jeff Feller, then host of The Open Room, asked me whether it was my first time performing at the cafe, to which I responded that it was. He then introduced me to a New Yorican tradition. Whenever a poet appears on stage for the first time in the open room, the crowd, along with the host, serenades, serenades the poet with a communal singing of virgin, virgin. 
Over 20 years later, I can't remember what poem I read or what I wore, but I do remember that I was still femme presenting and not yet out as lesbian. I also remember Feller gifting me this, uh, this button. The button marks me as a New Yorkian poet and signals the start of my journey with the cafe. Thus the open room is the undercurrent for this text, functioning as an initiation into a society of poets, a non-competitive sphere antithetical to the hyper-commodified slam world and an aesthetic form. This form is also a forum for poetic exchange, grounding the practices of the New Yorkian while articulating an ethics of openness, a poetic undercommons. The undercommons refers to a conceptual space comprised of quote, black people, indigenous people, queers and poor people who come together in resistance to their positioning outside the commons. Instead of asking for recognition from those organizing structures that exclude and position them as problematic subjects, they continually imagine and create new spaces for themselves as modes of communal survival, according to Fred Moten and Stefano Harney. The open room at the cafe brought and continues to bring together the, those poets invested in spoken word poetry as a way to imagine other ways of being. There was an ethos of openness that undergirded the early, the early performances of the cafe and that continues to inform the present day version of the event. Yet footage and materials documenting this history are scarce. We can think of Marlise Mumbar's 1978 documentary, Viva La Isaida, that focuses on the Lower East Side as a useful historical record from the founding years of the cafe and the surrounding neighborhood. However, Mumbar was not the only person documenting performances at the cafe during the 1970s. This was something I discovered in 2018 as a visiting fellow at the Hemispheric Institute, the HEMI at NYU. During my time there, I've reconnected with Griffith, who, has recently, who had recently established the New Yorkian Poets Cafe Founders Archive Project, um, I was lucky. I've known Griffith for almost 20 years, first meeting her when I began hosting the Friday Night Poetry Slam at the cafe. And it was due to this connection and based on our previous collaborations that Griffith invites me to join her efforts to trace, gather, and catalog the history of the cafe via digital and physical archive. Thus, my involvement and work with, the, uh, with this archive is the next step in my journey with the cafe. A next step that includes by serving as a Mellon HIDVL or Hemispheric Institute Digital Video Library scholar in residence at the HEMI for calendar year 2022. We will actually be launching this um, archival collection this fall, this semester with a sneak preview scheduled, shameless plug, for Thursday, February 24th during a book launch event where I'll be in conversation with scholars Patricia Herrera and Arnaldo Cruz Marabe and Reggie Cabico, Emmanuel Xavier, and Andres Chulices Rodriguez, whose work I write about in the book, um, will all be in conversation with one another and I'll share some of the materials in that collection. In particular, during this event, I'll be focusing on how this digital archive operates from protocols established by the open room and within the genealogy of the New York aesthetic. Included in the collection are open reel magnetic tapes filmed by Stuart Reed, um, with specifically never before seeing black and white performance footage from around 1974. In conclusion, I'd like to share with you a poem that I wrote during my time as host of the Friday Night Poetry Slam entitled Ghosts in the Walls, followed by the final aspect of the book. There are ghosts in the walls, their scorecards invisible, their applause muted, they have no CDs or chat books for sale, no watches to give you, no trophies for you to carry home and definitely no book deals for you to sign. There are ghosts in the walls who don't care how much you scream, yell, or stomp your feet. They don't care whether or not you memorize it or reading it from the page. Memorizing it doesn't make it poetry. It just makes it memorized. There are ghosts in the walls ready to fight fake poets and wannabe slammers, ready to fight so-called wordsmiths who pimp their work to the highest bidder because it's about the dollar, not the dream, and money is what makes the world go round. And poetry? Well, poetry stopped being poetry and became a product. So they put on their best labels and line up, hoping that someone will pick them up before their shelf life expires, when real poets don't have expiration dates and their currency is timeless. There are ghosts in the walls who make you forget that it's a Friday night in New York City and you've waited online for an hour and a half, paid $7, now 20, and are now sitting on a dingy wood floor with people stepping on your feet, all because you heard that this is where poetry lives. There are ghosts in the walls who let you know that odds are you will hear poetry tonight. 
if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to disregard the judges and look beyond the theatrics to the words, if you trust and believe that the best poet doesn't always win, you will hear poetry. If you see beyond the arms flapping and the singing, if you see beyond the lit candle spread out in the audience, if you see beyond the polished act, you will hear poetry. If you sit back and let the ghosts guide you, you will hear poetry and it will become your own. There are ghosts in the walls whose lifespan extends beyond the visible. Angels who watch and guide us because this is their home. And they want to make sure that it's being taken care of. See, this isn't just another place where people get on the mic and spit. Fake poets, beware. This, this is the New Yorican. This poem is my homage to the history of the cafe, the ethos of openness that originated in the open room and the ongoing contributions of foundational figures such as Algarin and Griffith. Algarin's investment in activism through poetic verse, specifically the writing, production, and performance of poetry continued until his recent death. During our visit with him in 2018, we discussed the possibility of establishing a writing workshop for adults. We spoke about the early days at the cafe as I showed Algarin footage of performances by Pinero, Sandra Maria Esteves, and himself, all while Griffith urged me to record our dialogue as I continued to pepper him with questions. My conversation with him and Griffith that day helps me to understand how this conclusion is actually also an opening for further discussions on aesthetics and queerness as central to the cafe. Specifically as part of our exchange, Argarin told me that he felt that something needed to be written about aesthetics at the cafe. And I replied that my book aimed to do just that. Specifically, I told him how the, this book attends to queerness and aesthetics and how what he and Griffith referred to as being sexually fluid, quote unquote, in terms of identity, practice and adventure shows up in the work of contemporary artists, Reggie Kabiko, the Glam Slam competitors, and Alison Glenn as Black Cracker, alongside co-founder Miguel Pinero. Algarin nodded, as did Griffith, who texted me the following message later that evening. Dear Karen, thank you for being present today with Miguel. You're saying that the development of the New York and Poets Cafe, which represents the life work of Miguel and myself should be viewed as a diaspora, as an aesthetic grown from our community of marginalized people. Our aesthetic has nurtured many who have gone on to spread their voices in this world. I had not thought of our work in those terms, but your identifying it as having such influence seems accurate. Thank you for this validation. We must go further and create language to define specifics our aesthetic. Always in peace and love, Lois. With this book, I heed Algarin and Griffith's call. The specifics of the New York aesthetic Griffith's desires are delineated in the queer and trans poetics of Reggie Cabico, the Glam Slam participants, and Alison Glenn as Black Cracker. Their works enact their own countercultural critiques in the lineage of the open room and incendiary cultural politics articulated at the cafe in the earlier waves of the New York movement by Griffith, Pinero, Pietri, Algarin, and many others. It is a critique that begins with poetic verse but that through the New Yorkian aesthetic is mobilized beyond the physical location of the cafe, traveling between different spaces, times, and performance genres, extending New Yorkian potentialities and futurities to all who enter. Thank you very much. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, please use the code HIMED30 and purchase your copy directly through nyupress.org. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. I'm trying to un, I'm trying to uh, start my video, but it's <laughs> the host has stopped it. Thank you so much, and you know if we could give uh, give Karen a virtual uh, round of applause, that would be just just terrific. Um, excellent, and I love the poem. Um, I, I, I it's what fascinates me, and, and we'll get to some questions in chat. But I, I, I it just dawned on me that the New York Poets Cafe is is pretty much a half century history right now. And when you think about so many poetic movements and literary movements starting in a in a place, which is very common, those places very often are gone or totally changed within a few years. They become parking garages or, you know, a target or something like that. And and I think it's it's just amazing. It shows you that the cultural resilience 
of the New York Recomposed Cafe to have lasted all this time, in spite of all the changes around them and, and, and changes even within the cafe that it that it's still there. Um, and I I I think that's that's a beacon uh, for so many people. Yes, um, I think part of it has to do with the fact that Miguel Algarín was able to that you know the cafe they were able to purchase the building itself pretty early on at a discounted rate because it was run down, right? The, the, the building itself was in REM. It was originally owned by Ellen Stewart of La Mama Experimental Theater fame. And she used to use that as a place to lodge traveling musicians that were gonna perform at La Mama. So there's that downtown history between the New York and Poets Cafe and La Mama. So Algarin was able to purchase the, the space itself at a very at low cost. So, that, that there's that one thing. So raising rent wasn't necessarily um, as big of an issue as something that would be now. I think that there's a specificity also to the cafe in that it was uh, a predominantly people of color and sort of counterculture artist movement space that was tied into an ethnic or nationalist movement, right? The New Yorkian movement that actually had a physical location. Right, like if we think of the beats and we think of the Black Arts Movement, like the 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 New York Poets Cafe was that it was a building. It could house this movement. It could sort of use artistic expression as you know the one of the arms of these movements, and to be able to buy the building at low cost in that neighborhood at that time, you know, was incredibly helpful to for its maintenance. I think also they just. The cafe just received a grant a couple of years ago, so they're actually going to update the space. But it's still going to be the New York, and it's just ADA accessible, et cetera. Um, we've got we've got one question here. Um, you had mentioned that there's an event that's going to be taking place later this month, uh, where you'll be in conversation with some of the poets. Is, is there a, is there a link that accompanies that, or an event announcement? I don't know. They're still working on publicity for that. Um, I can share that once I have it. It will be on. I'll put this in the chat. Thursday, February 24th at 6 p.m. And the registration at 6 p.m. Hemispheric Institute at NYU. So we'll be launching. We'll, we'll, it'll be a book launch, but a book launch in conversation with sort of giving people a preview of the New Recon Poets Cafe Founders Archive Project. So we'll be able to share some clips um, from that time period, and then we'll officially launch the whole collection a little later that semester. But some of that footage is, you know, grainy black and white footage from the original. The, the thing is also that the space on 236 East 3rd Street is actually the third location of the cafe, right? It starts in Miguel Algarín's living room on East 6th Street. Then it moves to across the street, this bar called Sunshine Bar that later became, um, later it became a gay bar. Um, it was Easter Block, and then it was uh, Wonder Bar, and then it moved to 236 East 3rd Street. So there was a bit of movement before it kind of found its permanent location. As, as long as you, you have your chat, oh, there we go, somebody put it in, great. So people want to know what your discount code is. <laughs> oh, yes, please, buy copies of the book. I uh, just want to encourage people, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box, and Karen will be happy to answer them. Scrolling through to see if I missed anything. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Oh. Yeah, is there any way to gain access to uh, to the recording? Is that this, this recording or? To this recording or, I will say this, that once the New York and Post Cafe Founders Archive goes live, it's via an open access platform. So you don't need to be a member of the HEMI. Like part of it is so that people can use it in terms of teaching, in terms of sharing. Um, it really is about making this um, a platform and footage that you know, anybody, can, anybody can log into and anybody can check out. Oh, here we have some questions. What future works do you have planned? Thank you, Fernando. Fernando is one of my students. Um, I'm actually working on, I have two book projects I'm thinking um, about. One is Brown Butch Aesthetics, 
um, which is an anthology looking at brown butch aesthetics, um, including poetry, testimonials, critical writing, creative writing, creative critical writing, and uh, my next solo author text that is the anachronistic butch, uh, uh, oh, I, I have a title in my head, but we'll just leave it at the anachronistic butch. And I'm looking at photographer Lola Flash and issues of Afrofuturity, drag king Stormy Delavier, um, representation on television and movies, and a play by Margaret Gomez and um, Carmelita Tropicana. Oh, what, it, what advice would I have given myself, given to myself when you were first starting as a poet? Um, don't worry, not to worry about what people think, right? I, ne I was never invested in Poetry Slam. I was invested in you know, I started writing as an undergrad here because I was really, uh, I was really disturbed by, uh, by a lot of what was going on on campus. I arrived in 1993 during the Day, Ta Day Hall takeover that resulted in the establishing of uh, the Latina OX Living Center. So there was, there was a lot going on on campus at that time. And I, poetry for me was always a form of activism, of course, a form of, you know, consciousness raising in the really traditional sort of 1970s bent of, I needed to have my voice heard and I needed to use to utilize poetry as a way to raise awareness. Um, so it wasn't about applause and, and um, getting scores. Um, I, I would also have given myself the advice and I give this advice to all poets, read, read other poets, not just for writing, for form, listen to poetry. We have incredible resources online. We can, let's hear it. There's a, Go to the library. We have a, a ton of sort of poetry collections, contemporary artists, um, and those can really, only by reading, or, reading makes you a better writer, I should say. Watching performance makes you a better performer. You can sort of see things in action. Um, what's happening at the New York and Poets Cafe today? Right now, a lot of the events are still virtual. Um, it's open. Um, so, it closed down for a minute and then they were doing Zoom events. And now I think that they're doing limited attendance um, events. So some could be in person, some are online. Um, can I say more about the steward read footage? I'm thinking about the Louis side of figures that are caught on the footage. Sure, I mean, you see an early Miguel Algarin, you see current character actor, um, Luis Guzman. You see an artist, one of the, so I, I'll also be doing two things at the Hemispheric Institute um, this year. One is I will be writing about the relationship or the impact of AIDS on figures at the cafe, sort of thinking about a lot of the artists there, particular Al Garin and others. And I'll be examining the legacy of sort of queer women at the cafe, looking at someone like Stephanie Chapman and a search for Stephanie Chapman. All I can find is this little paragraph, but she's like in all of the all of the footage drumming, but there's nothing written about her except Stephanie Chapman was a member of a band called Lily Sina. And I'm at heart, I think at heart I'm an archivist. At heart, I think I, I need to dig through things and find um, and find what, what hasn't been unearthed. Was there in between? Not that I know, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I'm looking at Hugh Ryan's question. I am not aware of the relationship between the cafe and Cancaleva House. That is interesting. Uh, we don't have a specific date. What are the afterthoughts you're writing now that the book is done? What are the, thank you, Ella. What are the afterthoughts, postscripts you're writing now that the book is done? Um, I think, some of the things I'm thinking about that I wish I had written about or had time or space to write about was the relationship between AIDS and the cafe and definitely the stuff that I'm thinking about in terms of Stephanie Chapman. And that'll actually be an event at the cafe where I'm sort of a round table. Um, Cause Stephanie was a young lesbian musician from the Lower East Side who was there, was present during the early days of the New York Poets Cafe who actually passed away from AIDS. So it's, it's sort of a search for Stephanie Chapman, but it's also a round table where I'll be in conversation with other artists and activists um, who were there at that time. 
um, love is what. And is and there's an uh, and then can I speak to the visual aspect both historically and for contemporary neo life? That's so interesting. Um, thank you, Ariel. So, in thinking about the visual arts of the space and the murals, I think it's really important to highlight the fact that Lois Elaine Griffith is an incredible visual artist, and she's been there since the beginning. So while the space really focused, you know, so much of the history of the space or when it's talked about is around in contemporary settings is poetry slam and the written word. And there's a really strong undercurrent of visual culture. And you'll see that once the, once the digital um, archive is launched, you'll see that, especially in the background, there was Griffith, there were other artists and, you know, it's a, it's a key relationship and it's actually something that I will be looking at through, um, through a project that's being organized and curated at NYU through the Latinx project. So there's, there's something that's coming out about New Rican and Diasporican art and aesthetics in relationship to the New Rican. I don't have all the details with organizing a conference, getting a publication together, but there, there's stuff that's kind of brewing. So I think that that's a great, um, I think that that's a great question. I think people are, are sort of bringing that together. I just went through Fred. I hope I didn't. I didn't. That's okay. And, and I, I've kind of got one for you too. I mean, I sure related to your poetry more than anything. Um, have you got? Uh, are, are you working on putting a, a, a collection together, a book together? And if so, I'm kind of wondering. You know, there's poetry as text, and there's poetry as spoken word, and how you feel. The, the 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 three dimensional aspects of the of the kind of poetry that you hear at the New York Cafe would translate into print, or what you might do to enhance the print. In fact, sure. I mean, I think since the beginning, the work that occurred on the stage at the New York in the beginning, so much of the work that was written was both on the page and on the stage. Right? You had the New York collection that was edited by Alberti, the the New York Voices, um, Alberti and Pinero part theory, part poetry, part essay. Um, so many of the writers for them, it was, I'm a poet, right? This is, this is pre-poetry slam where it's competition. It's like, I'm a poet, I write it down, I get it out, but I'm also putting together this collection, right? We can think of the canonical early figures of the cafe um, as doing that. I think as there was an increase in issues of performativity through the advent of poetry slam and the melding of sort of theater and poetry that that results in sort of a hip hop theater mode. Um, there's a blending of that. I think that there's a way to make your poetry audible on the page without it necessarily being literally audible, right? We can think about you, something as easy as like, how do you space these words out? Do you elongate? You know, you create sort of visual poetry. Do I elongate this word so that people know that I'm expecting it to be read um, this way? And I mean, there's a long history of that. Right, we can think of of um, Shange's uh, choreo. There's a long history of sort of that type of writing. I think that some poets are are performance poets that whose work doesn't necessarily translate to the page because it's a great. It's very much about affect. I think that some people write and it's great on the page, and then they get up and it's like I can't hear you. You can so there. And then there are some people whose work. You're able to they're they're able to perform it and they're able to generate it on the page and it translates alongside different registers, right? Um, so th there's that element. I've always said that I wanted to write my book and I've actually had in depth conversations with my colleague, um, mentor, someone who I took classes with as an undergrad here, um, a, a beacon of light, someone who I love a great deal, Elena Maria Vida Montes who's an incredible writer. Um, and unfortunately, I just, it's one of those things where so much emphasis was placed on getting this book out that that kind of fell by the wayside, but it is definitely something that, you know, I have, I have folders of books. I'm that person that writes it, prints it out. I've got folders and folders of poems that I sort of need to compile and just get out. 
but it's, I, an, it's I, there for I, me. I, for one, definitely hope you have the time to do that. Thank it's you okay. so much. That's so <laughs> kind. And I'm so excited, like all these questions. I just, because I, I can't see anybody. I wanted to thank everybody for coming. We're all tired. We're all in the middle of a pandemic, sitting in front of the camera, watching the Zoom is just another thing on a Thursday right before Friday. You don't always want to do that. So I did want to thank everyone for coming. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll, if we can give you a, a final round of applause um, for such a, such a terrific, um, which is going to be hard to see, I think, because we can't, we can't see people. There we thank go. you. We by that, by about, by about 50 times. And, thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for attending the chats in the stacks. There uh, will be more in the future. And um, we hope, you know, as the pandemic recedes, fingers crossed, we'll be able to do these events in person again, which are always a lot of fun. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, audience. And uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Suzette. Thank you, Fred.